I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health in the Environment. Changer is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to the eighth and final webinar in our partnership series, Generation Chemical, How Environmental Exposures Are Affecting Reproductive Health and Development. The webinar today is titled Climate Change and Reproductive Health. This webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the University of California, San Francisco's program on reproductive health and the environment, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, um, uh, the Alliance for Nurses in Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility Societies, and UCSF's Environmental Research and Translation for Health Center. After the presentations, our moderators will lead a panel discussion. We will leave time following the panel discussion for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. During the Q&A, Karen will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. The chat feature is also open to the audience for comments and discussion with the speakers. For those of you who called in on the phone, we've posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. The webinar page is, has a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I am pleased to introduce our moderator today, Nathaniel DiNicola. He is a board certified OBGYN practicing in Washington, DC with Johns Hopkins Health System and chair of Telehealth for American College of Obst Obst Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG. In this role, he serves as the ACOG mobile and telehealth expert and leads their current work on innovation, which includes publication of the ACOG committee opinion on telehealth and telehealth system, systematic review in February, 2020, obstetrics and gynecology. He has also served as an expert consultant for national and international medical organizations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics and the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, or FIGO on adopting mobile and social media, public, producing education, educational materials and implementing best practices in telehealth. He is a published international speaker on the integration of telehealth, mobile and social media into medical practice. Prior to these current roles, he, co he completed the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also served as faculty on the Social Media and Health Innovations Lab and a senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. He is former Merkin Scholar at the Brookings Institute in Engelberg Center and Healthcare Reform. Nathaniel completed residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Tulane University, earned his medical degree at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, and received a Bachelor of Science Bio in Biology and university at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you for moderating today, Nate. With that, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, and to all the member organizations here who have made this possible. You know, up until very recently, when uh, people saw that I had these dual roles with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists between telehealth and environmental health, they thought there was really, you know, kind of no connection and, and you know, why was I spreading myself thin this way? But uh, to today is emblematic of what we've seen evolve over the last, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, which is that these topics are, are very highly integrated. Uh, here we are doing a Zoom. Uh, webinar uh, with speakers from across the entire world. Um, and the, the telehealth interventions certainly have implications for how we can approach environmental uh, considerations in conferences and delivery of healthcare. So it's an absolute honor to uh, be here in that capacity and, and also in my role as the environmental health liaison uh, between the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics with their Council on Environmental Health. This role really began um, generated by the pediatricians who for quite a, a number of decades now have been building their environmental health counseling in, in a, a book that they affectionately call the, the green book that most pediatricians have uh, that will alert them to uh, you know, toxic exposures in the house, things that could have poisonous effects for uh, children if they consume them, but an expanding array of environmental exposures. And as the pediatricians were looking at their patients, they saw more and more that by the time they were getting to them, even early on in childhood, it was almost too late in some ways that the exposure had already happened. And in some cases, unfortunately, the damage had already occurred. 
And so the, the title for this webinar, uh, Generation of Chemical, uh, you know, couldn't be more appropriate. The liaison role that, that I have filled and, and the partnership between these uh, medical societies was really meant to address this. You know, how do we how do we protect the children, not just during the vulnerable years of, of child and adolescent development, but even prior to that, during pregnancy, during preconception, and for the infertility uh, specialists here, you know, the whole role of epigenetics. And so when we talk about, you know, environmental exposures and reproductive and developmental health, there's such a wide uh, array of, of ways to approach this. And I think it's really helpful the way this webinar series has organized it for us, uh, you know, looking through all of the, the webinars leading up to, to this, you can see a very clear focus on things like infertility, on things like mechanisms with endocrine disruptors. And I think one of the, the topics that is that is most important in this space is what we're talking about today as the grand finale, uh, climate change and its its related exposures. And so it, it is an absolute delight to introduce uh, this, this very esteemed panel coming to you from across the world. We have Dr. James Crooks, uh, professor with National Jewish Health and the Department of Epidemiology at the Colorado School of Public Health. He has spent many years working with the US EPA and uh, continues to conduct research on how climate influences uh, our health due to things like extreme weather events uh, and environmentally uh, mediated uh, infectious disease and, and expanded patterns. A member of his team, uh, Mona Abdo, a PhD candidate at the Department of uh, Epidemiology uh, with Colorado uh, School of Public Health, uh, who has spent a lot of time researching how uh, HIV uh, affects aging populations, but also is going to tell us about research on how wildfires, uh, in particular how particulate matter 2.5, PM 2.5, can influence pregnancy health. Uh, we have Dr. Matthew Kursik, uh, a professor with WITS Reproductive Health and HIV Institute at the University of Waterstrand in Johannesburg, where he's coming to us, to us from today, uh, also visiting professor at the University of Ghent in Belgium. He has contributed to numerous international guidelines, including uh, for the World Health Organization. And he'll be talking to us today about a systematic review on extreme heat and how that influences maternal, fetal, and newborn health, uh, including some of the physiologic pathways that uh, kind of are the backbone uh, behind, behind those mechanisms. But the next speaker uh, to introduce is Dr. Bruce Bacar. Uh, he is an OBGYN, he is an author, he is an international speaker, and he has been my partner in crime in uh, many of our research and speaking endeavors. He was the lead author uh, who brought together this expert panel to conduct a systematic review on how climate change, uh, specifically air pollution uh, with PM 2.5 and extreme heat could influence uh, pregnancy outcomes in the United States uh, he led our team that reviewed 32 million U.S. births, and it is a delight to turn it over to Bruce to uh, have him tell us about that. Uh, thank you very much, Nate. It's a pleasure, as always, to be connected with you, and I really appreciate the invitation to speak to this audience and uh, to Generation Chemical and all the sponsoring organizations. Uh, this is exactly what we wanted to do as a result of our research. And... I'm trying to advance the slide. Here we go. Anyway, the uh, necessary disclosure slide. The only thing I have to disclose is that I'm not a researcher. I'm actually a clinician and an activist. And the bias that that leads me to is that I'm far more interested in what we're going to talk about at the end of my comments, which is the actions that we can all take as a result of this information rather than the data itself. We will talk about the data from our paper, but again, it's leading up to actions. As Nate intimated, uh, our look into climate's impacts on pregnancy really began with the American Academy of Pediatrics in late 2015, and the publication of this policy statement about all the impacts that were coming for uh, children because of what was then called climate change. And one of the quotes that was mentioned in this really important article was from the World Health Organization, who stated that over 85% of the disease burden of climate change would fall on children under the age of five. And that, I think, rocked our world, a lot of us in OBGYN and a lot, certainly a lot of pediatricians, to see such an uh, important organization make such a bold statement that seems uh, to be unfortunately rather true. 
Uh, but it led me to put together a small group of, of genuine academics, since that's not who I am, uh, to take a look at a follow-up question. And that was, was climate change actually affecting births in the United States? And it turns out that that was rather a lengthy process. We went through nearly 1900 uh, medical references uh, from all around the world. And it took a better part of three years. We ended up focusing on two very common exposures, heat and uh, certain types of air pollutants, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And also some very important and adverse birth outcomes, preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth. Again, focusing on domestic US populations because we were tired of hearing people make excuses that climate change is always happening either in the future or in some other location. So we wanted to see if it was actually happening here at home. And uh, we were very pleased to see at the conclusion of our research, uh, the JAMA chose to publish us. The date of publication was June 18th last year, which turns out to be rather important. But in fact, we didn't know what we were gonna find. And out of the 68 references that made it through our criteria, 57 of the 68 or 84% found a very significant association between these really common exposures, again, elevated temperatures and certain types of air pollutants and these really serious adverse birth outcomes. And as Nate talked about, uh, these are big studies, over 32 million births in total uh, and a mean of over 560,000 births per study. So uh, these were quite significant results as far as we were concerned. Anyway, just to get into our data a little bit, uh, in terms of the studies on preterm birth and air pollutants, 19 out of 24 found a significant association with a median increased risk of 11.5%. As far as low birth weight, 25 of 29 studies found a significant association with a median increased risk of 10.8% and four out of five on stillbirth with an increased risk of 14.5%. Uh, two points need to be made. First of all, this was not a, a meta-analysis. Uh, because there was way too much heterogeneity in terms of study design and study outcome uh, and timing in pregnancy and a lot of other variables. But we actually believe that the, the conclusions uh, of the association that we found are strengthened by all these different approaches to research that basically almost all came to the same conclusion, that these are substantially related. And uh, by the way, I just want to mention that the two air pollutants that we ended up choosing to follow that are uh, essentially what are covered in all of these studies are either ozone or fine particulate matter, or PM 2.5, because both are well known to be associated with climate uh, in very significant ways. Now, in terms of a cause and effect type of an argument, uh, and not just a, a statistical association, uh, here are some mechanisms that we mentioned in some of the references in our paper regarding air pollutants and preterm birth. First of all, Recall that PM 2.5 is a size distinction. It's a heterogeneous group of, of toxics that are defined by the fact that they're two and a half microns or less. What that does is it gives them ready access to the maternal bloodstream. Because of their size, they're able to penetrate to the smallest part of the lungs and get into the bloodstream quite easily. Uh, there is research that demonstrates systemic inflammation as a result of acute exposure to air pollutants, including oxidative stress, coagulopathy, endothelial dysfunction. Uh, and there are also documented changes in the function of the autonomic nervous system with elevations in diastolic blood pressure and, and reduced maternal heart rate variability. So all these mechanisms makes it uh, seem more likely that these associations are probably cause and effect. There's another piece of research that also reinforces that, and it's essentially in the form of a knockout test. Casey's study that was published in 2018 looked at the rate of preterm birth around uh, eight different fossil fuel powered electric plants in California over the succeeding 10 years after closure of those plants. And after controlling for other factors, what they found was a reduction in risk of preterm birth by over 25% in that time period, which again, both strengthens this idea that these two are related cause and effect, air pollutants and preterm birth. But it also suggests that any, any interventions we might make are likely to have really significant impacts on the kinds of outcomes we wanna prevent. So that's a hopeful sign as far as I'm concerned. The zero in on our heat findings, again, this was the minority of papers, 58 out of the 68 studies were on air pollutants and only 10 were on heat. 
But uh, looking down at the box there, four out of five on preterm birth and heat found in association, uh, and all three on low birth weight and both studies on stillbirth also found an association. So nine out of the 10 papers uh, found associations between heat and these bad birth outcomes. Now, this is an example of a study that's come out since our paper came out. And what we're finding with a lot of these studies, this one in particular uh, is an example, is we're getting more information on timing of impact. This study out of Massachusetts by Q's group found that PM 2.5 seemed to be particularly uh, toxic in terms of preterm birth in the third trimester. So that's helpful information. Uh, the other piece that they did was that they actually uh, linked the PM 2.5 levels and elevated temperatures, and in other words, heat, and found a synergistic adverse impact of the combination. And that's important because heat and air pollution often occur together. As a matter of fact, one can trigger the other. So we're getting more information from a lot of studies that have come out in the year since our paper's been out. This is another aspect, uh, a key finding in our data that we weren't looking for. And that is that it turns out that a lot of the papers, particularly around preterm birth and low birth weight and air pollutants showed real evidence that minority moms had even worse outcomes than everybody else. And over half of the studies, what was found was, again, minority mothers having worse outcomes than white mothers uh, in the same locations with the same sort of birth outcomes. And black moms, in fact, were called out more than twice as often as Latinas, which was the next highest risk group. So we uh, seized on this information. And as it turns out, as I mentioned, um, our study was published in JAMA on June 18th. It was the day before Juneteenth. And uh, there were two reasons I think we got a lot of uh, media coverage when our paper was released. And one of them certainly was just the timing of the fact that our study actually uh, kind of dovetail dovetails with the uh, already acknowledged fact that, that black moms are three times more likely to die than white moms when they are pregnant uh, in this country. So on top of that, now what our data seem to suggest is that, uh, again, minority mothers are at greatest risk. So I think that was one big reason why we received media coverage. And the other is that I think part of what drew us all together to look at this data in the first place was we felt like if we found evidence of an impact on pregnancy and birth outcomes from these common exposures due to climate change, that people would care to know about it. And I think that was borne out. And even this guy happened to tweet out the same day that our study was released. And I just wanna take a moment and say, isn't it nice to see that science is actually back in charge again in the federal government and uh, that their administration speaks frequently about the impacts of climate and also the intersection between climate and uh, racial justice. So uh, the question that I started out with in the title of my talk is what now, what do we do with this information? Well, first of all, I, I do think that the data suggests that patient care needs to evolve to include environmental exposures. And I know that that's somewhat of a big ask. Part of what is going to help us accomplish this is that we're now really fortunate just as of this month to have a guide from ACOG on reducing uh, toxic environmental exposures to uh, the prenatal population. And this committee opinion, which by the way, uh, our uh, moderator today, Nate, had an awful lot to do with, probably more than anybody else, getting this published and, and making it as excellent as it is, is a very thorough and well-researched uh, primer on how to assess environmental risk in patients. And that's a really important thing for us to have. So I invite you all to access this on ACOG's website. But I know everybody's too busy to be thinking a lot about environmental exposures on top of everything else they have to do in patient care these days. And I wanna draw your attention to Dr. Cheryl Holder's TED Talk, which you can find online. What they've done at Florida International University is to create uh, essentially a set of questionnaires to help identify patients who are at highest risk in their patient population for environmental exposures. And also uh, what they do is they administer those questionnaires using staff as opposed to doctor's time. And they all have a well-organized set of uh, what you can call risk reduction strategies to let patients know about you know, cooling centers in their neighborhoods, uh, perhaps a way to get a reduction in their utility bills so they can run their air conditioning more often that they may not know about. 
So there are ways to automate this within a practice that doesn't necessarily impact physician's time. It may take a bit of staff time, but I think if it lessens the chance that a patient's gonna end up coming to labor and delivery in the middle of the night uh, with contractions or something like that, then that saves everybody trouble. So this type of an arrangement is something that you can consider. Now, one of the invitations that we received as a result of our paper coming out was uh, a black and brown maternal health and environmental justice roundtable with the US House of Representatives Democratic Caucus. This was back in September last year. And what I liked about it was it wasn't just information sharing, it was actually a chance to really talk specifically about the sorts of things that the federal government could put in place that would actually help reduce the risk, in particular for minority moms during pregnancy. And as a result of that and those conversations, I'm uh, kind of excited to say that HR 957 is currently in committee before the House was written by uh, Lauren Underwood, who is from Chicago, a member of the House, and one of the people that reached out to us. And she's gotten a lot of co-signers, as you can see here. But this is a very practical bill. It provides funding for research, uh, for provider training and environmental exposures, uh, and direct financial support for patients in terms of uh, changing out uh, home appliances from gas to electric to improve indoor air quality, uh, also uh, support in terms of weatherization, and uh, also improved community monitoring and identification of what they're calling climate change risk zones for pregnancy in the U.S. So there are a lot of different aspects of this bill that I think are a very positive response to the information that we're getting. Uh, in terms of advocacy, though, and talking about physicians and health and climate, uh, first of all, I'd like you to know that there are some organizations out there that can help you become more uh, ready to engage in advocacy. And I think this is a really important thing to do, but let me uh, call out, first of all, Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. Uh, Eco America is a nonprofit based in DC that has an ambassadors program, essentially a half day training program for hospitals and medical groups uh, that's very specifically focused on how, how to write an op-ed and how to, how to go testify at a city council meeting and things like that, sort of the practical aspects of advocacy. The Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health is also a very valuable resource. Um, we've also had success in San Diego partnering the medical community now with a local nonprofit called the Climate Action Campaign. And you see on your slide the Public Health Advisory Council, which has been in place for about a year, but it's a group of uh, 11 of us and 10 of these docs are new to activism and we are showing up at city council meetings and participating in sign-on letters and, and uh, writing our council members under the direction of a very uh, helpful, the leadership of the Climate Action Campaign, which is a really prominent uh, nonprofit in San Diego. So these are all different ways for people to get involved with advocacy. And otherwise I'd say just get involved. Uh, in terms of conclusions, this was a quote that I first heard back last June at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was amazed to see that it came from Ben Franklin. But very importantly, I think the reason that, that environmental justice and racism keeps rising up within our society and then almost disappearing again is because of what Ben pointed out, which is that we all need to be talking about it, especially those of us who are unaffected by this. And we need to carry this forward, not only because we are healthcare practitioners and disparate outcomes are not okay, but also because we're human beings. And in conclusion, uh, one of the aims that we have in going forward uh, with our research is to change the conversation around climate from polar bears to pregnant bellies. We really do believe this is a powerful way that the health message and, and pregnancy and births are a very powerful way to talk about climate. And uh, the time is now for us to have these conversations. In case you're not aware, the Clean Air Act was passed in the 1970s as a health bill. And so healthcare professionals have played a role with major legislation throughout uh, at least our recent history. And it's time to do that again. And it, it is up to us and I welcome your participation. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce, for your amazing talk um, and for connecting policy to the science. Uh, while we're waiting for our next speaker to pull up his slides, um, I would just like to remind everyone to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those after our panel discussion. And it looks like we are just about ready to go. Take it away, Matthew. Excellent. 
Um, <clears throat> thanks, Bruce. Um, that was very inspiring. And there's a lot of overlap, I think, between our two talks. Um, but hopefully I'll add something new to your, to what you covered so far. Um, firstly, to outline my conflict of interest, I hold investments in the fossil fuel industry through my pension funds as per the policies of my university. And the university too is invested in the fossil fuel industry. It is thus in my financial interest to downplay um, links between fossil fuel industry and climate change. So in my presentation, I'm going to cover the review structure we had, and it's slightly more complicated than what um, uh, Bruce presented. The, the key um, findings and the framework that we developed from that, and then how that then moves into a framework of, of interventions. So when we started the systematic review, we had a very primitive causal pathway framework. Um, and the, the real point of the review, I think, was to try and nuance the um, this original approach, um, which at the time we thought was quite neat, but you'll see later that there's many problems with this uh, approach, even though it's um, quite an attractive figure, I guess. So, so this review is what's called a two-stage um, mapping or and systematic review. In the first stage, um, we would locate all the articles that, <clears throat> excuse me, on heat impact or heat adaptation studies. So that was a review of around 19,000 titles and abstracts in duplicates. You sift through all of those until in the end you've labeled or mapped um, heat impact studies and heat adaptation studies. And then you slice that into little pieces. So we sliced of all the African impact or adaptation studies for IPCC chapter. We, you know, you would take off little bits from that map. Um, so, for the purpose of today's talk, we, we're we discussing the 150-odd papers that we, um, the subset on, on heat impact um, on maternal and newborn health, and there were no uh, um, heat adaptation studies um, on maternal and new, newborn health. So in other words, there were no interventional studies that had tried to intervene on these pathways. Um, so then those 152 studies were then subclassified into um, a range of different uh, outcomes. Okay, so your exposures and outcomes. And we've done a pro uh, similar mapping before on maternal health. So I won't go into detail, I think, on this. Bruce has covered this, um, although we, we did do a meta analysis um, and the BMJ kind of um, the British Medical Journal were, took some convincing, but in the end, we, um, we did do a meta analysis because I, I think that is useful to get an overall sense of the effect size, um, uh, although there are limitations, of course. So I think what I'm showing you on the slide here is that it's so important to try and break down the, the temperature um, pathways, if you like. So we, we examined um, the odds of preterm birth with, with heat waves, and there there was a little bit less heterogeneity, and I think the impact of 1.16 uh, odds ratio is, is quite substantial. Um, and the, the metric that I think is most useful, and I hope that studies use this in future, is what is the odds of preterm birth per degree increase? And that can be then operationalized. That information is really useful, I think, for um, applying in programs and applying in, in future uh, projections, et cetera. Um, but okay, so, so that's the preterm birth, and there was quite, um, quite useful associations. And as as Bruce indicated, you get the, with stillbirth, and the, you really get high levels of um, positive associations. Of and these may look like small effect sizes, but um, temperature and heat is a um, very frequent exposure, and increasingly so. So a small impact of 0 0.1 at a at a global level of 8 billion is actually quite large. So I won't go into all these details. Just on the left is the the, the meta analysis plot with the um, Heat waves left at the bottom um, <clears throat> was the per degree. And then we did, I think, quite a neat analysis. We took all the studies that had um, heat uh, that compared low versus high. So temperatures below the 90 foot centile to above. And we, we put them all in the forest plot. And the vast majority were on the right, except for a study by a friend of mine who, who then precluded us doing a meta analysis here um, in this case. But you can see on the right hand side. Um, most of the studies to the right of, of one. So I think what was 
um, the previous speaker said this very nicely. Um, move this thing out the way. That there's the, the, the risk is stratified in, in um, it's clearly, it, it's, it's stratified. This is shown in his studies, but again here, the, the risks of preterm birth, the, sorry, the, um, the impacts of temperature on preterm birth are larger in these studies among black, in these studies among Hispanic women and indigenous populations. Um, and then the, the impacts of heat on preterm birth among white women were, were lower in these studies. And similar in age, the, the younger women and or the older pregnant women had a higher heat vulnerability. Um, and of course, all of these will shift as, as people start adopting air conditioning in a widespread manner. So um, again, uh, this, uh, this shows that it's complicated and um, there's multiple what's called lag measures. So studies examine preconception heat, and I'm just showing the example of stillbirth that most of the heat exposures that were most dangerous were in the last week of pregnancy, but even heat during the first trimester, um, some studies showed association. Uh, the dark red is the most dangerous time period, I guess. But the lag structure is complicated. We also did a systematic review on congenital anomalies. And I think, so what, we'll, we, what we're gonna do is not go through each of the outcomes in our review, because what you really find is that most of the, the studies have a positive association where they show heat is, is, uh, is problematic and those that um, show not significant but in direction of impact. And it's really very difficult to get a sense of how you, what you draw out of these studies. I'll give you one example. We said that the, the point estimates were largest for atrial septal defects and heat. But it's really, we, we, it's hard to kind of draw clear conclusions. But I think these reviews are, are useful. The one that I, one, the one impact which I think people don't appreciate, and I thought this might be interesting for the group today, is, is that the impact of, of in utero heat, okay, this is like the Barker hypothesis, I'm sure many will remember. Your, your experiences in utero have major impacts for the rest of your life. Um, and um, so there were 12 studies we found that in Uganda, the, your ability to cooperate uh, in a group was uh, associated with your heat exposure in utero. There's some um, uh, multiple, this is, these, these findings are very heterogeneous. Um, um, when you're looking, there's epilepsy in childhood, there's multiple eating disorders. There's a whole range of adult and child outcomes that are associated, that are associated with uh, the amount of heat exposure in utero. I can just give you one example. Um, of this, so this showed that uh, the in utero average heat exposure, if you were above 28 degrees um, average, uh, and especially if your in utero temperature exposure was above 32 degrees, and this was a study that covered most of the US, your income was around $30 less per the additional day um, of heat exposure. Um, and I asked my mother, she confirmed that it was very, it was a heat wave when I was, um, when I was in utero and that accounts for the, um, my financial difficulties. <laughs> and so the methodological challenges, as, as already noted, there's an intense methodological diversity and bias. Yeah? So um, exposures measured in multiple ways, there's range of publication biases, multiple testing. Most of these qualities are, of these studies are relatively poor quality. Reproductive health epidemiology in itself is incredibly complex, um, albeit fascinating, but it really is a, um, makes analysis and interpretation difficult. There's statistical heterogeneity. In other words, the findings of studies are different in different places, and that's, that's because populations have differential ability um, to cope with heat. So those are real uh, important findings. Um, and that's physiologically, and, and over time, you'll get progressive adaptation, especially in um, air conditioning, which will nullify impacts. And that might be interpreted as heat is not dangerous if there's no, if we're unable to detect um, impacts uh, going forward. And that's something like the air conditioning uh, nationalism, like vaccine nationalism, they're analogous. And that's really a problem in many ways, but including in statistical heterogeneity. So, I think going forward, we try to pull all of our findings together, but 
remaining grounded in physiology. Um, and I'm not going to go through this, but but I think whatever conclusions we make really need to be understood in a physiological, uh, detailed physiology approach. So to put it all together, we um, we made a framework. So the purpose of systematic review is to there was then to advance our initial framework and make it much more nuanced and and to um, to to make all those 150 studies to substantiate each of these links um, and each of the outcomes that we had um, identified. So uh, we found papers on seven papers on preeclampsia and heat, um, for example. And on the left, let's go from left to right. On the left, it's who are the high-risk pregnant women? So that's, um, for example, the, the women who are older or, um, or younger or a black race, et cetera. So who is at high risk? And then what are the impacts more physiologically? Um, so abnormal glucose metabolism, for example, what are the impacts on the health system, um, impacts on infections? And we know the heat, most infections are heat sensitive. Um, and, and how did that then translate into labor outcomes, um, maternal anxiety? There were a few papers on that. There was um, prolonged labor and some nice evidence from our setting that labor is prolonged um, during hot weather, um, antepartum hemorrhage, et cetera. So you, you kind of populate this flow chart and you try and put all the studies together. And I think that's the real use of, the, of these systematic reviews. Um, and as I noted, these long-term adult and child outcomes, I think are quite important. Um, so from our, our systematic review, and you'll share the slides so you can go through these uh, in, your own, in your own time, that I think the key gaps where um, we need more original studies yeah, um, is looking at impacts of heat on maternal anxiety and distress. I think dehydration is that's a critical um, um, outcome in our setting, the uh, uh, impacts of, um, on health systems. Um, and maternal mortality, and that's a specific interest of mine, um, of how we, when we are able to document the impacts of heat on maternal mortality, I think that will be a really important um, uh, step forward in, our, in um, our work. So the next step, once we have, uh, what we did is once we have this framework um, that shows the causal pathways, that then informs your interventions. Um, and in our, our recent um, grant proposals, we've really use this approach to show that, okay, if those were the, if those are the high-risk groups, um, then how do we need to target them? Um, and that's on the left where you, where these are the high-risk groups, the preventive interventions, yeah? There's the early warning systems, the cooling areas, prepare the woman, pregnant woman for heat waves, there's building modifications, nature-based cooling. That's on the left to reduce the exposure. Um, then in the second column, the heat impacts, um, um, our framework suggests hydration is important to monitor glucose because of the heat. Um, several studies shows heat and um, abnormal glucose metabolism. The impacts on health system suggest interventions. There were some studies that showed um, oxytocin and um, failures in the cold chain or in storage of oxytocin during heat waves, infection prevention, etc. So um, you kind of get a sense of based on the intervention, based on the systematic review, your interventions and how they impact on these pathways, I think is, um, you can substantiate that quite nicely. And to the right-hand side, um, it also starts to draw a step back in that we were interested then in what does this mean for the health information system um, that would then try and monitor these, these long, these um, population level outcomes. And, and of course, then suggest we need more systematic review so we can then start the process again. So, um, and I'm just finishing off here. So there, you would hope the whole process with systematic reviews is that your sequelae are systematic. Um, and we've discussed some of that, but, uh, but beyond that, we, we would move to try and understand how, how we attribute this burden of heat related conditions to climate change. Um, and then you would want to project this um, future burden of disease and the climate scenarios. So the figures that you got from the systematic review in JAMA, ideally you'd start to break that down. What is that? How do we project forward if, if the temperature increases by one degree? Or whatever? And, and, and then to understand what this means for the global burden of disease. And of course, newborn conditions, um, a preterm birth 
can result in 60 um, years of healthy life lost, or et cetera. So the birth, um, your newborn birth conditions are really a major contributor to global burden of disease. Um, and that's why I really need to understand that for, um, for advocacy and for resource allocation purposes. Uh, Real-time indicators we can start to develop if we understand these um, associations in detail. And if you understand the association between heat and preterm birth, for example, let's say in my district, I live in Cape Town, let's say we understand the association between heat exposure and preterm birth, in, in, in the district or the city of Cape Town. If we then implement uh, an intervention, cooling centers or early warning system, et cetera, and we then monitor what happens to that association um, and compare it before and after the intervention, we, we might be able to, um, to document effectiveness. So really what I'm saying is a systematic review that should all feed into a whole range of, um, of sequelae. And and um, and move towards the use of data science, um, which is a field that I'm I'm uh, moving into. How data science then fits into climate change. Um, so yeah, I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers um, and the Chamna project, which is doing um, um, some work in East and uh, Western Africa on um, on climate change and heat and maternal health. And Hannah, I think I stuck to time. No, nope, that's great. Thank you so much, Matthew, for this excellent presentation. And uh, Mona's going to be pulling up her slides here in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to remind everyone to put questions in the Q&A. And we'll get to those after our panel discussion. Feel free to start sending us comments, too, in the comment box. That's open to the audience as well to talk with the panelists. Take it away, Mona. Yes, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting us um, and inviting me to share results from our study. Uh, so I will be presenting results from a study that looked at uh, impact of wildfire smoke on pregnancy outcomes in Colorado between 2007 and 2015. Um, so just a little bit of background to provide context for the analysis. So as many of you probably know, Air pollutant, which include particulate matter, have been associated with adverse pregnancy outcome, which include low birth weight, fetal mal malformation, as well as fetal death, uh, and also similarly exposures to wildfire smoke, uh, PM 2.5 during pregnancy has also been shown to be associated with um, low birth weight and also um, other adverse outcomes that include respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, as well as all cause mortality. Um, and then in recent years in the Western US and Western Canada, there's been an increase in wildfire. So as the region continues to increase in temperature and warm up, wildfires are expected to continue to increase, which will lead to a worsening of air quality. Uh, and more specifically, Colorado is susceptible to uh, uh, an increase in wildfire due to uh, the transport of wildfire smoke from upwind region. So a significant fraction of the smoke in Colorado um, comes from smoke that is transported from the U.S. Northwest as well as Western Canada. Um, and that is expected to increase in the future, which will lead to an increase in smoke levels. And as the smoke level increases, it is important to try to understand um, the different associations between the, the pollutants that are released from the wildfires and how that can be, how, how that can affect birth outcomes. Um, and before we did our analysis, there, was, there wasn't a lot of studies that looked at that um, or looked across multiple fire seasons. So there was a gap in the literature. Prior to our study, there was only one that looked at uh, birth weight and the study only looked at a uh, one year time point. Um, so uh, that bring us, brings us to the overall study aim of our study, which was to characterize the association between wildfire smoke exposure and birth outcomes by trimesters. So uh, going into the methods of the study. So for our population, we use the Colorado Vital Records Registry to um, 
look at birth records. So that we found um, a total of 589,992 birth records. And out of those, there was a total of 535,895 that met our inclusion criteria, which included um, singleton birth between the years of 2007 and 2015 and uh, a gestational age between 30 and 42 weeks. And then for our exposure, our main exposure was wildfire smoke, uh, PM 2.5. So that was estimated using a previously published method, which um, basically incorporates uh, ground-based monitors and remote sensing data. And then the concentrations are matched with maternal zip codes. And then our secondary exposures of interest are ambient temperature, PM10, and ozone. And those are computed slightly differently. So we used um, a buffer distance uh, to compute those concentrations. So we used a variety of different buffers. So a smaller buffer will, um, re will result in more accurate characterization of the population exposure. Um, but then you get a higher proportion of zip codes with missing versus if you do a larger uh, buffer system, you get less missing, but you the accuracy of the concentration is reduced. So we used a uh, 20 kilometer uh, as the main buffer. And then we also looked at 5, 10 and uh, 50 kilometer in our sensitivity analysis, just to see if those uh, had a difference on the results of the study. And then looking at our primary outcome, so our main uh, first main outcome was preterm birth, was, which was categorized as uh, birth with estimated gestational age of 37 weeks or less. Uh, and then the second outcome of interest was birth weight, which was looked at as continuous. And then we also looked at numerous secondary outcome, which included uh, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, neonatal intensive care unit admission, uh, assisted ventilation following delivery, low birth weight, which was uh, characterized as infants weighing less than uh, 2,500 grams. Um, and then the last secondary outcome was small for gestational age, which was ca characterized based on if the birth um, were less than 10 percentile for their gestational age. And then we had uh, numerous covariates that we looked at. So mother's education, graduated index, which is um, looks at prenatal care, birth year, birth month, some uh, behavioral variables, so alcohol and smoking during pregnancy, uh, and then income, asthma, prenatal visit, race, ethnicity, as well as maternal age. So then for our analysis, we initially did descriptive statistics to characterize the cohort. So means and standard deviation and then frequency and percentages. And then for the preterm outcome, we did logistic regression models. And then we also um, looked at, um, we did separate stratas for each zip code. And then for the continuous birth weight, we did a mixed model and included a random intercept to account for the different uh, zip codes. Uh, and then for our secondary outcomes, since they were all um, categorical, we did logistic models. And then for our sensitivity analysis, we had, um, we used, like I mentioned before, the different uh, buffers to see if those changed the results. And then also we looked at including different confounders in the model to see if uh, any of our covariates um, changed the results. And then looking at some results, so this is a time series of uh, monthly wildfire with, um, so on the x-axis it's years and then on the y-axis it's the monthly average PM 2.5 concentration. So in black it's the total PM 2.5 concentration and then in red it's the wildfire PM 2.5. So as you can see over um, the study period the total PM 2.5 actually decreased whereas the wildfire uh, smoke increased over time. And then this is a map of the mean wildfire exposure density by zip codes. Uh, so we can see that the in Colorado, the south zip codes actually had a lower uh, PM 2.5 concentration compared to the north and northeast zip codes. 
And then looking at the results from our model. So this is for the preterm birth. So we found the significant ones are re reported in red. So we found that the uh, exposure during the second trimester or during the entire pregnancy had a significant impact on preterm birth. So mothers who were exposed had higher odds of having a preterm uh, birth when we adjusted for all the potential um, confounders. And then this is looking at birth weight as an outcome. So for this one, we only found a significant association with exposure in the first trimester. So uh, mothers exposed to, in the first trimester uh, had about negative 5.7 gram lower birth weight for every, one, for every unit increase in exposure. And then looking at some of our secondary outpoint outcomes, so we found a significant positive association between exposure to wildfire smoke and gestational diabetes during the first trimesters and entire pregnancy. So women who are pregnant women exposed in the first trimester had higher odds of having gestational diabetes. And then similarly, we also found a positive association with gestational hypertension, but that one we found the association significant during the first and second trimester, as well as over the entire pregnancy. And then for the NICU admission and assistant ventilation, so those results were uh, contrary to what we had hypothesized. So we actually found a negative association. So mothers who were exposed um, had lower odds of uh, NICU admission or assisted ventilation, which is not what you would um, expect. And then to kind of go over some strength and limitations of our study. Um, so for strength, we had a large sample size. We looked at uh, numerous out gestational outcomes. We also looked at multiple years of data compared to previous studies that only looked at one year of data. We also had uh, numerous variables that we could adjust for and account for in our, in our model. And then for limitations, uh, the, the variables were self-reported. So that could be, a uh, woman could under-report some of their, uh, some of the variables or there could be uh, misreporting with the self-report. Also ambient exposure might not accurately reflect uh, personal exposure. In our study, there was also very few pregnant women who were uh, exposed to significant wildfire for a duration of, for extended periods of time. Um, and then also we did not have specific birth dates. We only had month and year of birth uh, to calculate the gestational age. So then uh, kind of concluding our results, we found uh, that wildfire smoke exposure in the second trimester was positively associated with preterm birth. Um, and then wildfire exposure was associated with gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension. And then looking at some of the future directions, so kind of a follow-up from the results was to look at race ethnicity, um, and how like stratify by race ethnicity to see how those results would vary um, as well as with socioeconomic status and also look at if certain um, lifestyle variables such as alcohol use or smoking during pregnancy modified the associations that were um, that we observed. Uh, and then to kind of just conclude uh, moving forward it's important to uh, develop intervention that are specifically aimed at uh, reducing uh, pregnant women exposure to wildfire smoke to reduce adverse birth outcomes. And then some public health recommendation, um, pregnant women who are exposed to high levels of wildfire smoke who can't um, reduce their exposure could wear a dust mask out, outdoors or they can limit their time outdoors so that can reduce their level of exposure. You can also build uh, indoor air filters in their house to kind of also reduce the exposures and reduce adverse outcomes that are associated. Um, and kind of similar to what everyone else or the previous speakers as climate change um, is expected to increase and also the wildfires are expected to uh, intensify. It's important to target, to develop interventions that are target, specifically target pregnant women 
uh, when trying to develop wildfire smoke exposure reduction strategies. And that kind of brings me to the end. I just want to thank you again for allowing us to present the results from our study. Thank you so much, Mona, for your great presentation. We're going to jump into our panel discussion now. All our speakers would like to come on camera. Um, and I would also want to welcome um, James Crooks, who is a senior author on Mona's study, who's also here to answer questions. Um, so take it away, Nate. So thank you to all for uh, these these fantastic presentations. Uh, every time I uh, have the privilege to, to watch from these, I, I learn so much. I, I guess the question at the top of my mind, uh, which, which might be a, a bit of a tough question to ask the panel, but let's let's start off with a hard one and then we'll get into some of the um, kind of peripheral ones. So we heard data about 32 million US births and we saw things about knockout tests. We saw interventions such as air conditioning that seem to provide some kind of mitigating effect. We saw something <clears throat> in the range of a dose effect uh, when it comes to proximity to um, the exposure. And we see something about timing effects when it comes to uh, the specific uh, period of pregnancy where the uh, toxic exposure is most impactful. So th this can be for the, the whole panel. How, how close do you think we are to establishing a causal link as opposed to just a really interesting exposure and association? And I, I ask this by way of saying within obstetrics, and I think within pediatrics, we don't hesitate at all, for example, to say that tobacco smoke, you know, will will trigger a preterm birth or will be strongly related to uh, growth restriction. Uh, we don't hesitate to say that in, you know, pediatrics, tobacco smoke in the house will, you know, be related to risk for ear infections and down the road cancer. So where, where I guess maybe I'll phrase a little bit differently so nobody has to be on the spot here. Where do you think we are um, in, in that paradigm with these exposures of air pollution and heat related to all the exposures we just talked about? Maybe I'll, I'll ask. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna just because somebody needs to, I'm the least qualified to make these sort of scientific pronouncements because again, I'm coming in as a clinician. Uh, but I think it's an extremely important question. There's there's no doubt that we need more research to help to bolster bolster and clarify uh, the relationship <laughs> between these exposures and outcomes. But I think there's an awful lot of smoke, and to, uh, I'm, I'll apologize to, to Mona and Jim, uh, but if there's smoke, there's probably fire. I think we know an awful lot at this point, um, and part of this sort of cuts the legs off the question. Uh, we can have an academic conversation, and I'm sure the research needs to go on for many more years to really fully clarify these, uh, these connections. But I think importantly, we know enough to act now. And that to me continues to be the underlying message that uh, it's very likely that these are associated. We have a number of mechanisms that have been identified as likely uh, causative things between heat and air pollution and how they can impact pregnancy. I think we know enough to act. So I'll just, I'll just start with that comment. Um, and I will say also that um, yes, we know a lot. We know a lot about the mechanisms within the body, about how specifically air pollution affects um, inflammation and how it affects the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. And, um, and all of those should have impacts on pregnancy. So it, it, it's, it's um, pretty clear that air pollution specifically has an impact on these respiratory outcomes. It would be really bizarre if it didn't. Um, very, very surprising. I mean, pretty much all the evidence points to it should have an effect. Everything we know mechanistically is that it should have an effect. Okay, well, thank you. To, to uh, dovetail on that, uh, I don't know how popular the TV show is internationally, but uh, at least in the US, there was a TV show uh, called House MD, where Dr. House would take on this very, you know, kind of complicated uh, medical problem. And he would say, well, let's just assume the diagnosis and jump straight to the intervention. So hearing uh, some of the comments so far and looking at some of the questions in the Q&A, uh, they seem to be kind of uh, barring a, a strategy from Dr. House and saying, do we have some interventions that we can jump to? 
and let's just assume the association is is linked at least, but it's causal or not. Um, what what would those interventions be, and what would testing that look like? Uh, I know that we've we've kind of uh, you know hinted at some of them, but if if we could do more targeted ones, what would those look like to the, the researchers here? Bruce. <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about the bill before the House right now, H.R. 957, <clears throat> but I also am very enthusiastic about the potential for intervention at the local level and uh, things that we're working on in San Diego uh, through this nonprofit that we work with are, are measures like building electrification. Starting, it turns out to be the easiest rung on the ladder is with new construction. Uh, but, but indoor air pollution is a very serious threat to health, and I can't think of a more important patient population to protect than pregnant moms and their babies, but let's talk about anyone with asthma, uh, anyone with COPD or other cardiorespiratory types of illness. Uh, indoor air pollution is a very, very serious issue, contributes to climate change in addition, um, but there are a number of things that can be done, and we can push for all of us can push for in the cities where we live um, to switch away from fossil fuels, both indoors and outdoors. So uh, transportation, uh, buildings, uh, these tend to be the primary drivers of climate change in terms of uh, just a percentage of greenhouse gases. So uh, thanks, Matthew, but that's where, that's where my mind goes with that one. How about you? I wonder, I wonder, Nathaniel, maybe if we could switch, because I, um, you know, I'm familiar with my setting, and I think this would be quite interesting for for um, for people at the same now. So, and and of course, Africa is the continent hardest hit, the least resources, least responsible for climate change, etc. So, um, and I think in, in our setting, the the key time is is during labour, labour and childbirth. Um, so a pregnancy is high risk, but it's really the labor and childbirth, I think, which is most important. Because here, the, the woman is generating an immense amount of heat during uterine contractions. Um, she she's, has to lose that heat through sweating, etc. So, so um, <clears throat> you know, labor can be 10, 12 hours, and it's a major, um, you know, um, at heat generating amongst other. Um, so... So, so, and in many of these settings, those the health the health buildings are really poorly constructed. They're made of tin, and the, it's warmer inside the building than outside the building. There's often there's issues around clean water supply. So, for me, it's those kind of settings where I think internationally that needs to be the focus. Getting the labor ward a little bit cooler, water fans, fans that that uh, release water, water vapor. Um, yeah, having a some a nurse who's trained. During hot weather, health workers' um, abuse and disrespect go up. So um, it's kind of those, and trying to figure out um, more long-term modifications to the building. Um, Hannah did some work on urban heat islands and trees, etc. So it's really complicated out there. I think in in um, uh, low-middle-income countries, yeah. And I'd also mention um, in terms of interventions for protecting individual patients uh, who may be exposed, particularly to the, the particles and, and smoke or other kinds of particles. Um, there are two that Mona mentioned uh, quickly that I, I wanna expand on a little bit. Um, one is um, wearing a mask outside. Um, the kind of mask you need to protect from particulate pollution is not the sort of mask we have all been using for the past year and a half with COVID. You need something with a really tight seal around your face has a pretty fine uh, filter on it. Um, so the cloth masks that you've probably been wearing uh, are, are not gonna be very protective. Um, the other thing is uh, indoor air filtration. Um, so if you have central air conditioning in your home, you probably already have a filter. So making sure that the filter you have is, is switched out regularly. Um, you can also get sort of room specific air filters um, that you can, you know, plug in and run in a room and clean the air in that room, so you can have like a clean room. Um, I will say that the those are a little pricey. You know, I just bought one on sale for like forty dollars, but usually they're more expensive. Um, there are also a lot of companies that sell those devices that like to upsell you on a bunch of extra junk that don't actually help. Um, so you just want like something that does basic air filtration. You don't need like an ionizer, and you certainly don't want to have something that 
increases ozone levels in your house. That's like a terrible idea. Definitely don't want to do that. Um, so you just gotta, you know, be careful of what you're buying. Um, and you can even sort of build one yourself with a box fan and uh, a home uh, air, one of those big square air filters that you use in an HVAC. You can just buy one of those, tape it to a box fan, and you have a, a very cheap, um, basic indoor air filter. So, so some really interesting answers uh, here. I, you know, on, on the one hand, I see a uh, kind of uh, paradigm that's already shifted during the, the COVID uh, pandemic response, which is uh, some degree of, of uh, normalcy to wearing a mask. And so perhaps this is something that we prescribe to pregnant women in specific times of pregnancy or specific times of wildfires. And uh, the, the, that, by the way, is, uh, Bruce mentioned the ACOG committee opinion on uh, reducing prenatal toxic exposures. Those uh, interventions are mentioned there, uh, both in terms of uh, occupational exposures and regional exposures. Uh, but also what Matthew mentioned, you know, it, it's generally accepted that operating suites are cold. Uh, the temperature typically is around 68, 69 degrees, and that's, uh, you know, for a number of reasons. One of them is uh, infection control. Uh, so, Matthew, do, do you think we'll see in the, in the future some kind of hospital, uh, you know, regulation system where labor delivery suites themselves are, are maintained at a certain temperature to help optimize the, the labor and birthing process? Yeah, no, to, your point is good. And I think, you know, in high-income countries, that's the... Um, I think that's 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 kind of a given, I guess. As as places with resources will adopt um, a whole range of strategies that, like I said, nullify the impacts of heat in many ways. Where um, heat will is it, perceived as a nuisance, and even though it's it might be forty, um, I don't know, it might be 110, 20 Fahrenheit, but it will won't really have health consequences as as the high income countries get better at adapting to it. Um, and next time Bruce does a systematic review of preterm birth in the US, it probably won't find an impact because <laughs> getting better at air conditioning. So I think that's that having a standard is not, not a, you know, but the reality is for most of the world, there is no cooling. There is no cooling. Yeah. There just isn't ventilation, there isn't air conditioning. Um, so for the world, until we answer how, how a pregnant woman can deliver when it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit and she has no access to cooling. Um, how she can safely deliver, then you know, that's yeah, that's a question we need to answer as a world, yeah. And I think so, Matthew makes a really important point here. Sorry, Nate, but uh, the fact that that some of our efforts to adapt might end up obscuring the risk of what we're facing and would certainly not be uh, accessible to all populations. But just even in a in a bigger sense, I think we have to be very careful that with all the great research going into uh, figuring out these associations and adapting to them, that adaptation is not cure. And the way that I look at the climate crisis is it's more like a cancer and not like a chronic disease. We're not going to adapt our way out of this. We must eradicate this problem. It has to be eliminated. And so we can't take our eye off the ball and just think, well, gosh, if we you know, have, have cooler uh, delivery rooms and everybody gets out you know, free, uh, first of all, everybody doesn't. And secondly, um, the problem will continue to worsen until we actually face it and solve it. Yeah, th thanks, Bruce. Really touching upon uh, the, the points that, that we need to raise. And so along those lines, it, it seems like some of these interventions are uh, systemic. They, they go beyond the uh, efforts of an individual. This last year, uh, I think, has highlighted more than ever the role and the need for uh, scientific voices in leadership and policymaking. How do, how do you think, not just among physician communities, but among uh, all the scientific communities represented here, how do, we, how do we strengthen that voice so that there's not this uh, kind of severing between public policy and, and scientific discovery? Well, I can explain what I do, because um, my feeling is that previous generations of scientists have kind of thought there was this implicit deal with the political leaders that, you know, we go off and we do our science and this political, we stay out of politics, but the political leaders listen to us and then act on our science. That has completely not worked at all. And so my feeling is that we have to move past that to do something else. Um, so there are specific organizations that help people in healthcare and in, in biomedical science. Um, get more involved in, in policy 
making. There's one in my state of Colorado that I that I work with a fair amount, and there are others nationally and internationally. Um, so if you know, I encourage people to get involved with those organizations. I don't know, Nat, could I just add one thing? I don't know how we are in terms of time, but could I just add one thing to what was just said? And it's interesting, I was chatting to Bruce uh, on the sidebar about the same thing that, and I like um, <clears throat> what Jim was just saying. That, but I think for me, it's, and I have a little bit of a background in activism, um, as most South Africans in, in some form have. Um, and, and it's to always find a hook for us, yeah? So that your activism or, or something has, has some angle that you know is compelling, you know, um, or some, some way that you drawing on a health background, for example. So just as one, as one example, and I think you saw that on my slide, I, I always start by shaming my university. Um, even when I present, I always say, look, my university is vested, heavily invested in fossil fuels. This is our, we, we believe this is the future and, and <clears throat> the best thing for the university is for us to expand fossil fuel exploration. And that's in our interest and, and we hope that that happens. Financially, it would be the best thing for us. So like, that's my hook. And I know that it irritates them. H, human resources has been screaming at me, but that's fine but I, because I know that it irritates them. And, and I'm right. And, and, they, and, and they know it, but I've got a hook. And, and so I think if journals, for example, have had the same approach, we disclose tobacco funding, you disclose, we should disclose this too, for example. But it's just the, the example of trying to find a hook that you then tongue. Yeah, I, I, I was really uh, fascinated to see that in your disclosure, and and I think uh, it it frames it in a in a really compelling way. Uh, look, looking to the future, uh, I, I did want to ask uh, Mona. So, you know, you you have a research interest that has uh, you know been predominantly in, in maybe another field with HIV and aging, and yet uh, you have still found your way into this. Where, where does this topic uh, stand as a priority among among your kind of colleagues and your cohorts? Uh, beyond, say, a specific career interest? Is there something bigger that that um, is dis discussed? Um, I mean, for me, um, this started right as in my first year, but recently in the school with like, there's been, a, especially in the EPI and um, environmental health department, there's been a lot of like discussions and webinars um, on climate change and uh, social disparities, especially like in the past uh, couple months. So I think there's a lot of interest for me and for my other cohorts, other as something outside of your main research interest um, to kind of focus on. And a lot of people are interested in other like side projects to kind of go into that field, but not specifically, it might not specifically be their main like dissertation or something like that, but it's definitely been brought up a lot in the past year, even in like the epidemiology department and biostatistics department, which you wouldn't, they just do data stuff, but there's been a lot of interest in the students as well. So. Yeah, wonderful. The, the, I, I asked because the students, the residents who I teach uh, have, a, have a very strong vested interest in this even if it's not going to be their area of research. Um, it seems sort of like for many, you know, for a generation at least, um, for physicians and anybody who's in the health field, it would seem kind of, um, I don't know, bizarre if you smoke cigarettes, for example, in, in public. That, that, would, that would be contrary to being a good citizen and a good physician. And I do wonder what, um, what the next kind of eco-friendly step of that will be, if it would be bizarre for hospitals to generate so much plastic waste or bizarre for people who care about this to, um, you know, not refuse the plastic utensils. Uh, so I, I want to close with one last question, then I'll turn it over to whatever time we have left. Uh, I think we've touched upon the questions that have come up in the Q&A, but uh, one of the ones that I just saw, I think is really important. Um, and I'm going to direct it to Bruce first and then uh, invite anybody else to answer. When, when you do meet with these uh, policymakers at, at any level, uh, local or, or larger, what is the general response that, that you receive um, from, from meeting with them? It's amazing because uh, I, I had no training when I started showing up at city council meetings and participating on committees and boards and things like that. And, and what I've always noticed is no matter what the particular political persuasion would be of a city council in Oceanside, for instance, where they're so-called so conservatives, uh, we've always been received very well, very politely. Uh, they often ask 
better questions than I expect. Um, but we have a number of tools to uh, assist them in opening their eyes and, and thinking uh, maybe more along the lines of science. The elected officials are, are there oftentimes thinking about their own reelection. And so they need cover if they're gonna break with their political party's stance. And the two things that you can give them right away uh, as a science uh, advocate working on climate issues and health are first of all, that whatever it is they do that helps to reduce fossil fuel burning or you know going along with building electrification or community choice energy, these things all have immediate health benefits to the people in their district. So they can talk about them from that standpoint that what, what solves climate change is gonna take a while, but what is going to help human health from that is nearly immediate. And so that's a really valuable thing to give them. Uh, and, and the more of us that show up, the more cover they have uh, in talking to their colleagues. You know, people like to do what the doctor said and uh, or at least act as if they've done what the doctor said. And so uh, the more physicians and health professionals that show up and give them scientific reason and also justification in protecting their, their constituents uh, helps them vote the right way. So I'd say we get treated rather well and uh, they don't always vote our way, but, but I think the more we bring to them of these things, the more likely it is to happen. San Diego, by the way, has changed from red to blue in my 20 years being there. And uh, it's beer and biotech now. And it's a much, you know, the demographics are shifting, public opinion is shifting. And we shouldn't assume that just because a council voted a particular way five years ago, they're gonna go that way now. Yeah, it seems to me that the, the thing that keeps politicians up at night is the thought that some, some action they take will be blamed for loss of jobs. And the, the only thing that has as much resonance um, for them as you know, talking about potential job loss is people's health and people dying. Like if you know, someone shows up to a you know, committee meeting or something and says like, this is impacting my health, this is you know, killing my child, that, that has at least as much resonance as, you know, this might threaten my job. So, you know, it's really important to use a health framing around this. That's, the, that's something that can really, um, you know, keep people's, keep politicians' eyes on the ball. Yeah, and, and Jim, thank you. You're reminding me of my second point, which is that, that the economics of these changes are good too. When you protect public health, when you help people stay out of the hospital and run up large bills, uh, you help save the community money in addition to families' money. So there's more and more evidence coming out that stopping the climate crisis by uh, instituting better health measures and getting away from fossil fuels is an economic winning argument as well. And even Orange County, north of us, that's been known to be bright red for a long, long time. Uh, it's where Nate uh, spends a lot of his time now. And I, I think uh, that must be interesting, the conversations that you hear, but they are becoming much more blue in their voting as time goes forward because of the economic arguments as much as anything else. Uh, and, and frankly, I don't think that's anything that any of us need to feel bad about. There is money to be saved uh, by moving towards a cleaner future and doing it rapidly. Yeah, thank you. I, I would have to agree. The health message resonates um, in a very in a very substantial way. It's no coincidence that we have now this medical society consortium on climate and health that resonates that message from really every dimension of healthcare. And I, I suppose uh, you know I'm biased, but like George Clooney, just because I'm biased doesn't mean I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> that the 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 lever of uh, you know the, the next generation being affected very directly during pregnancy you know things that things that uh, that affect pregnancy do seem to have a little bit more of a kind of um you know health reflection than than say some other outcomes and so i think this panel and this uh this body of research is is you know ever more important i will i will turn this back to the moderator um uh, either karen or hannah here because i know that we're up against time. Um, I think we've addressed, at least on some level, most of the questions for the Q&A, but uh, perhaps if there are specific ones that weren't addressed, um, you know, those can be can be looked at now. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Um, <clears throat> there was one that uh, the speakers didn't touch on, but maybe Matthew, I was wondering if you could answer. Studies seem to ignore male sperm effects. Um, did you, In your systematic review, did you look at uh, time before conception or any male reproductive health effects? 
<clears throat> That's a good question, and it's complicated. Remember what we said about reproductive epidemiology, in that um, one of the main problems is that you you can get early fetal loss and, and pregnancy that's not even not even uh, detected, or or, or um, early abortion which isn't recorded. So in a study of sperm or of IVF, those are the the, the um, reproductive assisted reproductive technologies. Those are the those are the best studies that we have because you can then you're having a proper denominator. You're knowing exactly when <clears throat> when someone was pregnant or, or not, and then you can examine the heat effects. So there is a few studies that have looked at this quite nicely, and that's evidence that is probably quite um, solid. But the interesting thing is it goes in both directions. There were some studies that um, uh, IVF and other um, or kind of conception studies showed that heat was harmful, but then the um, particularly one famous one in Saudi Arabia, um, which had mark, remarkable findings of pregnancy loss um, from IVF, depending on, on um, heat wave, et cetera. But other studies that showed the opposite. So, um, and, and there was a, <clears throat> some interesting studies, some historical studies that during heat waves, people, there was less procreation. So, uh, so it's, it was too hot, to, you know, for, so, um, so it, it is quite a fascinating topic, but um, it, and of course heat re reduces uh, sperm count, etc. So it is complicated. But I'm happy to share about five or six papers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then we had one more that someone sent in. Does the mm -hmm. composition of wildfire smoke change change as it moves further away from the direct source? In this case, wildfires in the United States, Western United States. For instance, today we are seeing elevated um, PM 2.5 on the East Coast, um, and the source is uh, fires in the Western states. Uh, the answer is yes, it does change. Um, certainly, when it, if you're talking about particles, the larger particles tend to fall out of the atmosphere first. Um, and so the further away you are, the size composition changes and shifts toward the, the smaller particles, which are actually the most dangerous ones. So um, the larger particles have fallen out, but the smaller ones haven't fallen out yet. Um, also, the gases change. Um, so many of them sort of react with other gases kind of as the plume flows along um, and change, um, you know, the chemistry changes. Some of those gases diffuse in a different way than the, uh, the, the, the ash plume itself. Um, and so they sort of may get disconnected from each other a little bit. So th there is there is definitely a change in composition from immediate downwind of a fire and 500 miles downwind of a fire. And do we know how that if, if, um, might differentially, you know, impact health, the changing composition? That is a tough question because there's actually not a lot of research on mixtures of air pollutants. Um, and so when I am doing, you know, Mona and I did this project um, where we were trying to isolate the fire specific PM 2.5, that's probably also sort of um, kind of vacuuming up the effects of some of the gases that flow along with the smoke plume um, that we are not really able to characterize very well. Um, so, you know, we're sort of treating this mixture as if it's one pollutant when it's, when it's not. Um, it's just really hard to do study, epidemiology studies on the scale that we were doing, um, looking at multiple pollutants at the same time. It's just very complicated and there isn't a lot of monitoring and so you have to get like you know your friends who do numerical modeling of air pollution and flow um, involved and then it gets much more expensive yeah we've done some webinars on mixtures and it's it's definitely we need to do more research but it's tough yeah all right well i think we answered all the questions and we're over time so hannah i'll turn it back over to you great thank you so much karen um, and thanks to all of our panelists here today we're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership webinar will take place tomorrow, July 28th, and is the first in a two-part series on microplastic pollution and the effects of phthalates and other plastic-borne chemicals on Alaska's ecosystem and Alaskans' health. The second webinar in this series will be held August 18th. You can find details on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. 
Additionally, if you appreciate these Chase Partnership webinars, bring you the latest environmental health research for free. We encourage you to support Chase's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I'd like to thank our speakers, Bruce, Matthew, Mona, Jim, Jim, and Jim for making time to present today and to you, Nate and Karen for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness. Have a great day.